Welcome back to the Alex Jones Show. This is the fourth hour overdrive. I am Leanne McAdoo, your host. Now, the United Nations has been warned that delays in negotiations over the future of lethal autonomous weapons or killer robots, they're moving too slowly to stop robot wars from becoming a reality. Now, experts, including physicist Stephen Hawking, Apple co-founder Steve Wozniak, uh, Tesla CEO Elon Musk, they've all warned that proliferation of autonomous weapons would make a global arms race inevitable. Now, uh, my guest today is Noel Sharkey. He is the Emeritus Professor of Artificial Intelligence and Robotics at the University of Sheffield. And after years of detailed research within artificial intelligence and robotics, Noel's core research interest is in the ethical application of robotics and AI in areas such as the military, surveillance, and criminal terrorist activity. He's currently serving as chair of the NGO, the International Committee for Robot Arms Control. Uh, they're a group, they've been campaigning against the use of military robots. Noel, thank you so much for joining us. So talk to me a little bit about this stall at the UN. What does that mean? How is that setting us up for killer robot arms race? Well, we've been, uh, we went to, a, there's a committee at the UN called the CCW. And that's the committee that's really designed for prohibiting certain sorts of weapons that are unnecessarily injurious, like fragments on the battlefield, landmines, those things. And we went to them, we got mandates from them. So they've, they've run expert meetings and they've run expert meetings two years in a row now for five days each time. But now we want them to move forward to the next stage of negotiation. But what they're saying is that next year they're going to go for another expert meeting. And this is becoming like an annual conference instead of moving towards getting groups of government experts together and discussing a possible treaty. And so what, what, is, what do you believe is causing that delay? I know uh, in one of the articles there, I mean, we have all of these ethicists warning of the potential dangers, and yet yeah. they're stalling. And we know that there are already some of these semi-autonomous weapons in use and the development yes. of so much more. Yes, they're developing pretty quickly. Uh, the U.S. have guidelines that prevent them being acquired for a period of five years. And there's, well, there's another two years to run on that. But in the meantime, DARPA, your Defense Advanced Project Research Agency, is developing like crazy, really. They keep in issuing new contracts for tender, like they're looking at swarms of autonomous boats that with, uh, can swarm a, another craft. They're looking at swarms of, of planes. They're looking at autonomous submarines that can go under the water and sink other submarines, but they could sink ships as well, of course. So the technology is developing and developing. And the point is the language that uh, the US and UK have insisted on using at the UN is that these are meetings about emerging technologies. Now, China have said they want it to be about existing and emerging technologies. Now, the problem with the wording emerging technologies, and it is an emerging technology, but if we keep on at this for another three or four years, by that point, they will no longer be emerging. They'll be there. And so the treaty won't have any teeth to ban them. Wow. And then so the the U.S. and the U.K. are insisting that using this wording, uh, I guess a lot of money is going into the development uh, of yes. these machines. Yes, but of course, they're not saying that that's why they're doing it, mm -hmm. but it just strikes anybody with any sense that that's what's happening. But the machines are quite dangerous. I mean, they're they're really obviously when in the discussions, I've learned an awful lot in the discussions and I've been I've been working in this campaigning since 2007. But I've learned an awful lot at the UN in, in recent times about the kind of military reasons for having them. But <clears throat> It's so important that all nations discuss this because when the U.S. talks about this, they seem to have this idea that they will developing them and all other nations' technology will stay exactly as it is today. So when they're doing these kind of scenarios to test the weapons, they're thinking that China and Russia and these countries will have exactly the same weapons that they have today, whereas in actual fact, what we're going to see is an arms race and mass proliferation. And at the moment, there's nothing against that. There are no laws against these whatsoever. So if we get mass proliferation and billions of dollars, because there's billions of dollars at stake here, big companies involved, if billions of dollars get involved, then, you know, how are we ever going to stop it? Exactly. And, and just speaking earlier about the terrifying power of tech giants, Google 
as a matter of fact, they've jumped into airspace monitoring. They want to make room for drones there, so they want to control that airspace. But they've also uh, recently acquired Boston Dynamics, so which yes. is one of the most advanced robotics company in the world making robots for the military. They, they what does Google acquired, need with that? Five, <laughs> five robot companies, major ones, all the best wow. ones in the world. Now, Google said that they would only see out the existing contracts with the Boston Dynamics. So they had, they had a couple of years of contracts left for the military, and they said they wouldn't do anything more with the military. But what's happened? Uh, just three weeks ago, I found out that there's a brand new Google robot, like the big dog that you all know, called Spot, and it's being tested by Marines. So I don't know what Google are playing at here, what sort of game they're playing at, but it seems very strange to me. Yeah, absolutely. And to have the foresight there to go ahead and control the airspace that the drones are going to be flying in. So obviously well, something's going yeah, on. They're competing with Amazon. Mm -hmm. Amazon in, in Europe have are trying at the moment with the regulators to get a whole portion of airspace. It's something like... Uh, 100, uh, 200 yards and a thousand feet in the air, and they want to control that airspace so that they can start doing a lot of Amazon deliveries. And I think Google and they are competing with each other for this. Right. I, I mean, it seems that seems like a crazy idea as well, really. Because yeah. if you think about the number of deliveries, are we going to see the sun at all? I mean, the, the sky is just going to be littered with these things, and it's so easy when you've got that kind of stream of stuff, to slip some machines with bombs in them uh, onto, onto that stream and we could never detect it. So it's very worrying. I mean, there's a whole worrying development outside of what we're talking about just now. And there's a whole worrying development with the police use of these uh, technologies. And I don't know if you've heard there in Texas, but North Dakota uh, this month, it was last month, sorry, late last month, uh, passed a new bill um, saying that the police are now allowed to arm their drones with less than lethal weapons. And that means that the North Dakota police now can arm their drones with tasers, with rubber bullets, you know, firing rifles that fire rubber bullets, tear gas and a pepper spray. And this is a very, very worrying development to me because it gives the police too much power to control. Well, absolutely. In North Dakota, I mean, they don't even have that much of a population there. So why do they need to authorize their police to have armed drones with less? Well, they're one of the biggest drone users in the US, in fact, for some mm. reason. I don't know why. Maybe it's because they don't have such a big population. So, But anything that starts there, it's like a domino effect, isn't it? They mm. will test it out there. And if it works out well, it will spread. And, and you know, already in South Africa, these, these tools are being used to suppress uh, protest. Exactly. So, you know, you're going to see peaceful protest because the problem is that what you consider to be a peaceful protest can change over time. Laws can change. And the more control you have, you're not putting police officers in harm's way. You can fly overhead, fire pepper spray, fire tasers. So you start getting a large protest like Occupy Wall Street, that kind of thing. And, you know, the police can move in and, and pick people off and certainly photograph them and steal their private data. Oh, absolutely. And we've uh, just recently reported that the UN uh, and the US there, they're forming the, their global Stasi network, uh, policing the globe, basically. And we see Saudi Arabia is beheading uh, two young men who were 17 at the time that they were arrested for protesting against the government. So, of course, the, they're going to be going after extremists and those terrorists that they are actually looking for are people who are going to be against the totalitarianism of the state. It's not going to be actually people who are attaching bombs to these drones, uh, such as they are <laughs> with these. No, exactly. Well, the problem with the word terrorism, sometimes it's, we call them freedom fighters. It depends on what side you're on, mm -hmm. really. I mean, the United States used to, used to bomb the redcoats from civilians and nobody called it. They certainly didn't call them terrorists in the United States when they did that. Uh, sometimes it's the only way to it's the only way for populations to stop uh, an authoritarian government is to rise against it. And the more technological weapons you have, the harder that is. The really is absolutely. And then, so talking about the ethics with these uh, military robots, can they get away with war crimes if a robot unlawfully kills someone in the heat of battle? Who's to blame? 
that's a very big problem and and uh, it's very difficult to get a satisfactory answer i mean the answer that that concerns a lot of military people in fact i've spoken to quite a few military commanders and they're concerned because they say the buck always stops with them but they're not happy about it because they don't understand how they work and the other thing about them is of course it would be easy to commit a war crime with this kind of robot weapon and then just blow it up afterwards so there's no trace i mean you know there's you can't hold a robot accountable for a war crime and it could easily be the software manufacturer, people can hack into them. I mean, Honda cars have been hacked into and the brakes applied and the steering wheel turned so they skid. So it's you can hack into anything. I mean, I've actually met somebody who flies drones that hack into other drones and steal them. Wow. So <laughs> it's, you know, we're moving into a technological future and I, I think we're not thinking about it enough. I mean, I don't think you can really stop you can't really hold back the tide of uh, technology or stifle innovation and, and stop jobs. But certainly you really need to be thinking about it a lot more. There's not really any joined up thinking. And the US, for a start, should have really a, a strong committee that are looking at these things constantly and thinking about the near future. And we're not talking about 50 years away. We're talking about now, this minute in time, like it could happen next year. When North Dakota are getting these weapons, what will they have next year? And you have a company in Texas, in fact, called Chaotic Moon. It's a robot company. And they have made this little, and, and people say nowhere else but Texas would you see this. They've made this little autonomous drone, right? So it's a drone that flies completely on its own without any humans. And what it does is it hovers over your backyard. And it's it's called Cupid, the drone. And it's called Cupid because it hovers over your background, backyard. And if somebody enters your property, it will say, leave immediately. And if they don't leave, it tasers them. So it fires a taser dart at them, 50,000 volts, and keeps them there until you arrive back or the authorities arrive back. Oh, wow. <laughs> and, you know, that's, that's quite something. And I can imagine police using those for area denial. So they'll say... You know, yeah. instead of putting up barbed wire or whatever, you say this area is denied. And if you enter into it, you're going to get tasered. Right. And of course, they won't use those at the border. Um, but I actually I remember when they were displaying that during South by Southwest a year or so ago, they said that they had a lot of interest from law enforcement. And they were like, well, this is just a prototype. We just did this to show people how you know, dangerous it is that we're just advancing with this technology and there aren't any rules saying, no, you can't attach a taser to a drone. Um, well, now let's talk a little bit about, you know, we're moving forward with this. Can we stop a negative outcome? Yes. I mean, we can have new laws. Uh, one thing, the the pressure we're putting on the UN for the, with this CCW committee, it's strange, but if we succeed in getting a, a prohibitive ban, an international treaty, it will only apply to international armed conflict. It will not apply to domestic use. So, for instance, tear gas is not allowed at all. It's totally prohibited in war. So you can't use it in conflicts, but the police can use it. And so getting this prohibition will not stop your police or anybody's police from using it. But what you can do is there's another committee that we're pushing for. We're really working hard to get them to pay attention. And that's called the Human Rights Council. Now, the Human Rights Council, they, they set up our human rights, basic human rights for the entire planet. And if we can get them to say, you must not arm these these drones and these uh, autonomous weapons onto police mustn't use them then they won't be used i mean they might be used but they'll be in violation of the human rights council and nobody wants that really now are you talking are you about the same human rights council that has just chosen saudi arabia to be one of the leaders yeah i'm afraid so but the thing about the human rights council is i mean you get you don't always get the best choices, but the good thing about it is it's not dominated by Western countries. It's rotates. So the members rotate all the time, mm -hmm. and that's a good thing. So, you know, sometimes you can draw a bad hand, sometimes you can draw a good hand. But if you look at the Security Council, then you've got Russia, China, United States, the UK and France dominating it all five of those countries have a right to veto so no matter what votes are taken even if the vast majority say yes we mustn't do this or we mustn't go and fight this war 
those countries can veto it. But it, with the H, with the Human Rights Council.